Hello. Um, hopefully uh, you can see me and hear me. Uh, I just need to check uh, with the administrators to make sure that's the case. Sounds great. OK, excellent. Um, I uh, need to get my slides up now. I'm seeing myself and not my slides. Uh. Uh, excuse me, I'm having trouble getting the slides up. Uh, they were on my screen, now they've disappeared. Ah, okay, here they are. So thank you very much uh, to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Halton. I uh, am a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at the U of A, and I also direct the Li Ka-Sheng Applied Virology Institute. In that institute, we have a number of vaccine programs, which I won't be discussing today. And uh, we have a large number of uh, programs designed to develop th uh, therapeutic drugs for various diseases. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the programs in which we're applying computation-assisted drug discovery um, and artificial intelligence. So these are collaborative programs. We have our own computational scientists in our institute and then we collaborate with uh, principal investigators who are either computational scientists themselves or uh, uh, medical, uh, medical people or biologists. So the first one I'd like to discuss with you is a program uh, headed by Jack Tuzinski, who is a prof in physics as well as oncology. And he's been working on a new bladder cancer chemotherapy drug. Uh, in which he's used computational assisted drug design. Uh, his program has been funded uh, variously by Alberta Cancer Foundation, the Allard Foundation, uh, our institute, as well as the Alberta Health Services. So cellular microtubules 
have been a, an anti-cancer target for some time, and that is because um, uh, they're made from tubulin, and microtubules play a key role in cell division and motility. Um, they're comprised of alpha and beta tubulins, proteins, and uh, some existing uh, cancer drugs stabilize or disrupt microtubule structure and hence uh, have an anti-cancer effect. Uh, there are num numerous tubulin isotypes, uh, and expression varies with cell type. So what Jack Tosinski has been focusing on is beta-3 tubulin, mainly because its expression is increased in cancer cells uh, relative to other tubulins. And it's been shown that silencing beta-3 tubulin with RNA, silencing RNA, sensitizes cells to uh, anti-tubulin drugs such as paclitaxel, as well as sensitizing cells to DNA binding drugs such as cisplatin and doxyrubicin. Uh, so targeting beta-3 tubulin is a new target in oncology, and there are no um, specifically uh, specific drugs targeting beta-3 in the clinic. Um, so what Jack did was to base his um, drug development work on colchicine. Uh, colchicine is a drug that does target microtubules, and um, it's known to target the interface of alpha and beta tubulin subunits, and it does effectively inhibit microtubule dynamics and assembly it has a known safety profile. There are adverse events using it, but it has been approved for gout and familial Mediterranean fever disease. Uh, computationally, he has docked colchicine into beta-2 tubulin on the left, and you can see uh, the colchicine molecule in green with various uh, side chain groups uh, R1 and R2, um, as well as um, the interactions with the cysteine-239 and the tyrosine-200 uh, and the threonine-353 of beta-2 tubulin. And the challenge for his lab was to make a derivative that would better fit the pocket um, in the interaction with beta-3 tubulin. That's shown on the right. And you can see in beta-3 tubulin, there are amino acid differences with uh, beta-2. And his challenge was to computationally find derivatives of colchicine that will be predicted to be better binders to beta-3. So he succeeded in doing this. And uh, I'm showing here a few of his derivatives. He actually derived 70 or so derivatives. And these are some of the best hits. And uh, th this is a graph or a histobars histograph looking at how these top drugs uh, bind to the tubulin-3 um, pocket. Uh, we're looking at here simulated binding free energy of these drug derivatives. And you can see that the one on the right that's in the red box, CR42024, was predicted to have a significantly higher free energy of binding to beta-3 tubulin than, uh, than the original colchicine shown on the left here. So that became his lead compound. And um, he's obviously looked at the effect of that drug on microtubules in lung cancer cells, A549 cell line. And when he uses that drug, he sees uh, a disorganization of the cytoskeleton of the microtubules, uh, membrane damage and blebbing. The IC50 of, of, of his lead drug is much lower than colchicine, which means it's much more potent. There's a reverse relationship between IC50 and potency. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see normal um, the A549 cells untreated on the left. You can see the nucleus and the microtubules, the tubulin within microtubules in the cytoplasm and the uh, membrane. 
And you can see the effect of adding colchicine, one micromolar, to these cells. You see shorter microtubules, and they are disorganized relative to the untreated. And with Jack's lead, lead drug, you see even more potent abnorm, abnormalities of the uh, microtubules, uh, much shorter and uh, highly disorganized. Uh, and, and so that's good. Um, he has tested his drug in uh, nude mice, uh, immunodeficient NSG mice, containing a patient-derived bladder cancer xenograph. And uh, in this graph here, you can see the growth of the tumor over time, shown in green, in the untreated mice. Um, the blue shows the uh, effect of adding uh, gemcitabine and cisplatin to these mice on a regular basis, where you can see the tumor volume is uh, somewhat increases, but is largely um, controlled. And then his drug, CR4224, shown in the red, has a similar profile to gemcitabine cisplatin. In other words, um, it provides another drug to control um, tumor growth. So um, Jack Tuzinski, um, with, found that, uh, with funding from uh, the Allard Foundation, has done all the preclinical work required. And, and he has permission now from Health Canada to start a phase one clinical trial at the Cross Cancer Institute. And hopefully um, COVID will resolve uh, soon enough so that he can start this phase one trial in March of this year. I'd like to turn to another program that our institute is involved with, and this is a program headed by uh, Professor Harlot Barakat in the pharmacy school at the U of A, and has a large team of uh, senior PIs associated with it. As you can see, Lorne Terrell, Joanne Lemieux, Fred West, Arno, and Shokrola Alahi. So that's a virologist, a um, biophysicist, a chemist, a toxicologist, and an immunologist. And the objective here is to make small molecule inhibitors of the CTLA-4 immune checkpoint. Um, a few years ago, monoclonal antibodies to checkpoints like CTLA-4 were approved for human use in various cancers. And they've been shown to be a, a, to, to give rise to a substantial um, improvement in cancer care. For the first time ever, some patients with metastatic melanoma can be cured with these antibodies, um, as well as some lung cancer patients and uh, bladder cancer patients also. Um, other checkpoints uh, that antibodies have been made to that have been approved for human use include uh, PDL1. Um, and there's a lot of activity with all the other checkpoints as well. So antibodies are used and are approved. Um, the problem is with these checkpoints, they relieve um, immune suppression. Uh, checkpoints emerge on T cells as a consequence of persistent antigen stimulation, either in the form of an infection that persists or as a result of cancer antigen presentation, which is persistent. The immune system has a way of turning off the immune response after several weeks by upregulating these immune checkpoints. The trouble is the antibodies, when they're applied, while they enhance cancer therapy, they also uh, increase autoimmune effects, uh, recognition of self, and, and some, sometimes those uh, side effects can be very severe, even fatal. Antibodies, of course, have quite a long half-life in the body, and so we thought that it would be very good if we could make small molecule inhibitors of these checkpoints. And uh, over time, we focused on CTLA-4. And not only if adverse events occur, can we simply withdraw the drug, because this will be orally delivered, but also when checkpoint, different checkpoint inhibitors are combined, the potency increases, the cancer therapy is improved substantially, but so are the, the side effects. So. The field needs to move forward with combinations of checkpoint inhibitors, but it needs to be able to do it safely. So we see an important role for small molecules in this paradigm. Uh, so this work has been funded by the Alberta Cancer Foundation and the uh, Lika Shing Applied Virology Institute. 
And so um, Harlard has modeled CTLA-4 uh, on the T cell binding to B7-1 uh, on the cancer cell and on the antigen presenting cell. You can see that CTLA-4, shown in green, exists as a dimer and binds to B7-1 dimer uh, to actually deregulate the T cell activity. The T cells are still able to recognize uh, the antigen, the cancer antigen, but they're no longer functional. They're not effective in terms of cytokines and killing and so forth. So the objective is to try to design drugs at the interface of CTLA-4 with B7 to abrogate that interaction, thus releasing the immune system to recognize and kill cancer cells. Um, so what Harlard has done in his lab, he's uh, used uh, chemicals in uh, known databases like zinc at the National Cancer Institute and Molport, where the structures are known. And he's used, um, he's done structure-based virtual screening using Autodoc to the interface of CTLA-4 with B7. Um, he comes up with potential docking configurations shown here, to which he then performs molecular dynamic simulations and also estimates the uh, predicted free energy of binding. At the end of that funnel, uh, he comes up with thousands of hits, which are um, graded in terms of potency of binding, predicted binding energy. And then biologists get to work to find out which ones are positive. Um, usually this kind of method, uh, you can come up with maybe 50 or so or 100 drugs, and you usually find good hits out of that small number. Um, in contrast, drug companies, the major pharmaceutical companies, um, usually do wet lab screening of half a million or so compounds uh, to find their hits. So this is a, an ideal way for us to find hits uh, because we don't have very large, highly pedigreed chemical libraries at our disposal. Anyway, one such hit, N17, was obtained. And this is an ELISA assay looking for the interaction of CTLA-4 with B7. Um, and so we can monitor the abrogation of that uh, interaction. Here is shown the effect of the antibody to CTLA-4, the clinical antibody. You can see it very effectively inhibits the interaction of the receptor with its ligand. And N17 also does a pretty good job at, in, at uh, abrogating that interaction. This is a dose response uh, that you're looking at. So N17 was one of the major hits out of this program. Um, it still has a weak affinity. It, it has a uh, IC50 of around 30 micromolar, which is fairly weak. But you can see it is quite effective at blocking the interaction. Um, Joanne Lemieux has shown that N17 binds to CTLA-4 using uh, NMR. Uh, so we have clear evidence that it is targeting um, CTLA-4. And also, uh, Joanne in her lab has shown that uh, using thermal shift assays, we can see evidence, clear evidence for the binding of N17 to CTLA-4. You can see a thermal shift of more than three degrees in this particular assay. Um, what the team's trying to do now is to get more potent derivatives um, using chemical synthesis uh, guided with computation. Uh, the team's come up with a couple of drugs. Uh, here you can see in red N186 and in green 159. In the ELISA assay, they're both more potent than N17 shown in black. Um, and also you can see in a cell-based assay where one cell has CTLA-4 embedded in the membrane and it's interacting with a cell expressing B7 in its membrane, and there's a reporter system for monitoring that interaction. You can see we're getting some weak activity with these, uh, these derivatives. Um, it's not as high as we would like, and also there's a strange dose curve. The more we add, the less uh, cell-based activity is observed, and we think that's either a solubility issue of the drug or it's a toxicity issue of the drug. So. Right now, the team is, is in the process of hit to lead to try to improve the potency of these um, hits. But it's looking very promising, I would say. 
Um, I'd now, now like to turn to uh, a program where Jack Jamandis, uh, a distinguished neurology professor at the U, U of A, is the lead. And this is a program designed to develop novel therapies against Alzheimer's. Um, other key people involved are Dr. Tyrell, uh, Dr. Sahu, who's a computational scientist working on this program in our institute, Dr. Neiman, who heads the chemistry group in our institute also. Um, so accumulation of amyloid beta protein, which is a 42 amino acid protein processed out of amyloid precursor protein, builds up in the brain and is considered an early and seminal event in Alzheimer's pathology. Furthermore, microglia cells, which are uh, macrophage, macrophage type cells within the central nervous system, within the brain, uh, they have amylin receptors that mediate amyloid beta evoked inflammation. And so, therefore, amylin receptor antagonists, therefore, often an, att an attractive new therapeutic target for intervention in Alzheimer's patients. And uh, Jack, Jack's group published a couple of years ago some data showing that um, synthetic peptides that antagonize the amylin receptor can actually improve memory in a mouse Alzheimer's model. The mouse model um, is a transgene which overexpresses beta amyloid and develops uh, many of the symptoms seen in human humans with Alzheimer's, and is a common uh, animal model. Um, so what he reported in 2019 is that these transgenic mice overexpressing uh, beta amyloid, uh, beta amyloid, excuse me, um, at 12 months uh, show a marked improvement in memory when the synthetic peptide agonist, uh, antagonist, excuse me, is added to the mice. So this is a water maze, uh, the Morris water maze. Uh, the mouse is dropped into a water tank, and the mouse cannot see a platform um, that when he or she gets on it, um, obviously they're safe and can get out of the maze. So they cannot see that when they're dropped into the water tank. And so every day for seven days, they're tested in the water tank for their ability to learn how to get out. And uh, if we look at wild type mice first, shown in blue, you can see that after two days, the mice have learned to get out faster than on day one. Thereafter, in the next few days, um, the speed to get out of the maze is about the same. Um, however, if you look at uh, transgenic mice overexpressing uh, beta amyloid, uh, you can see in green that it takes them much longer to figure out how to get out. And over time, they do learn uh, to get out more quickly, but the time of exit is still much higher uh, than the wild type shown in blue. However, when Jack uh, fed these mice or administered uh, the, the peptide, synthetic peptide, which is an antagonist of the uh, amylin receptor, you, you get what is shown in purple. You get initially uh, a much longer time to get out of the maze, but they learn faster to get out relative to the controls in green. And you can see after several days, they're able to exit almost as fast as the um, wild type mice. So this is clear evidence for uh, being able to solve the maze to improve memory by administration of this amylin receptor antagonist. Um, Kamlesh Sahu then set to work to try to replace the peptide with a small molecule. So the amylin Receptor 3 is shown here. It comprises the calcitonin receptor in purple um, bound to the receptor activity-modifying protein 3, otherwise known as RAMP3. And so the peptide shown in green abrogates the binding of these two um, proteins. And Kamlesh um, screened 7 million small molecules in silico 
for molecules that could bind at the interface of these two proteins and possibly abrog abrogate the action of this receptor. Uh, once again, he came up with um, just um, 20 or 30 molecules that he predicted uh, would be strong binders. And in Jack's lab's assays, uh, which are various, uh, several hits were recorded. Um, so it's a very fast way to get hits uh, using computational um, drug screening. One of the assays, I don't have time to tell you about all the assays, but one of the assays is a surrogate assay for memory in rodent hippocampal brain slices. And it involves uh, long-term potentiation of signal in the rodent hippocampi. Um, so brain slices are made, then a electrical stimulus is applied, and then the transmission of that signal is monitored over time as a high-frequency synaptic signal. And uh, what we're looking at here is the uh, LTP, which essentially is a memory trace in wild-type mice, shown in black. So here they were stimulated electrically. And then over the next hour, the uh, potentiation of that impulse is measured. You can see it obviously goes up very quickly as a result of the pulse and then slowly declines, but still uh, there is evidence of transmission of that signal for 60 minutes thereafter. Now, in the uh, transgenic mice that are overexpressing beta amyloid, um, you get a different picture. In, those are shown in red. You see a, a shorter, a, I should say a smaller response to the electrical stimulation. It subsides and then almost returns to background levels um, over the course of 60 minutes. However, if the brain slice is perfused with the active peptide at 250 nanomolar concentration, you get what is shown in blue. In other words, a picture that's very similar to the wild type mouse signal. So this was published and clearly shows that a peptide antagonizing the amylin receptor can actually improve um, signaling of the synaptic response, as well as memory uh, behavior in the maze. Now, one of the small molecules that the team has come up with is 9012. And in the long-term potentiation assay, we're seeing a similar profile. In black is the wild-type mouse stimulated, and then synaptic transmission is monitored here. Uh, you can hardly see it, but it is there, the black, <laughs> black line. Uh, the wild, uh, excuse me, the transgenic mouse overexpressing beta amyloid is shown in blue very similar to what I showed you before. However, if you take the Alzheimer's mouse brain slice and treat it with the small molecule at one micromolar, you get what is seen in yellow, which once again is very similar to the wild type response. So we believe this drug and related drugs are able to um, exhibit properties of the peptide and hopefully will improve memory in these uh, animal models of Alzheimer. So um, currently um, we're testing 9012 and derivatives in Alzheimer's mouse models, uh, and we're administering drugs systemically or orally, hoping to see an effect uh, eventually with an orally delivered drug. Um, I'd like to finish um, the last few minutes with um, some work that we're also doing on cardiac ion channels. We got into this work uh, many years ago because Bristol Myers Squibb had developed a polymerase inhibitor of the hepatitis C virus. They ran a phase two clinical trial, and six of the volunteers who had hepatitis C uh, experienced cardiac uh, failure, and several of them died. Over the next few years, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, Squibb presented evidence that it was a mitochondrion poisoner. But what we showed uh, computationally, uh, we means uh, Dr. Barakat, uh, he's now a faculty member in pharmacy. He modeled the HERG potassium ca cardiac ion channel shown here. And computationally, he could show that the BMS drug actually could bind right into the pore of that ion channel. And uh, Anwar Mohammed, a postdoc at the time, was able to show in functional HERG assays in, in cell cultures, uh, along with Rakesh Bat, 
um, that um, the uh, drug did actually inhibit the function of the ion channel. So we think this could have contributed to the uh, heart failure. But what the, this work led to was interactions with uh, Sergei Noskov, who's a prof down at the University of Calgary. He's an expert in machine learning, and he's developed uh, an artificial intelligence model for predicting the ability of drugs to bind and block the Herc channel. Um, so I do not have time to go through all the details, and uh, he would be better equipped to do that rather than I. But essentially, he's come up with a machine learning model um, that very well predicts the ability of different drugs to bind and block the ion channels. So here, he's looking at several hundred drugs, all indicated with a plus symbol. And we're looking at the relationship between the IC50, the minus log IC50, uh, on the x-axis, and the score coming out of the machine learning uh, algorithm. You can see there's a very nice correlation. It's almost a perfect 45-degree line. And um, we are now transferring this model, or we will be shortly, to the um, Applied Pharmaceutical Institute at the U of A. Uh, so that this is a machine learning model that they can offer to their uh, collaborating pharma companies. Um, not only uh, can it predict the binding and blocking of HERG, but Sergey has used it very successfully to salvage drug drugs. Often, clinical development of drugs is stopped because HERG binding and blocking is observed. And that's often a cause for dropping the program. But sometimes drugs get quite a long way ahead uh, along the way of clinical development, sometimes into phase two and phase three, where a lot of money has been spent. And the final derivative is shown to be a Herc blocker. So uh, Sergey has developed multiple algorithms focusing on different parts of the molecule uh, to predict potential interactions with the Herc ion channel. Uh, and what this does is it gives a good indication of where the problem is, and then you can attempt to do things about it. You can modify that chemistry, thus abrogating the Herc blocking while maintaining the activity of the drug against its intended target. So he has successfully demonstrated this on, on uh, a couple of occasions. So we think this will be a very important tool to offer pharma for their programs. Okay, um, I finished now. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd like to again acknowledge the principal investigators and their labs who we work with on these various programs. And they are again Jack Tuzinski, Jack Jamandis, Harlot Barakat, and a big team of PIs, uh, and then Sergei Noskov. Um, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. I understand I've used all the time up, so uh, thank you again. <laughs>